I have another new book out. It's called Archi, a cosmogonic poem. And cosmogonic, of course, means the genesis of the cosmos. Cosmogonic narratives are those narratives like Hesiod's Theogony, let's say, or Ovid's Metamorphoses, that tell the story of the origins and evolution of the Earth in accordance with the known scientific knowledge of the time. And, and that is always being updated. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do this poem, uh, and it's written in a kind of epic style, so it tells the, the history of the Earth from the creation of the earth during the Hadean epoch all the way down to the emergence of high civilization in ancient Sumer, uh, which sets all the basic civilizational prototypes, so it would have been redundant to just keep going past the Sumerians. Um, uh, one of the reasons why, main reasons why I wanted to do this was to have a poetic vehicle that contains within it all the up-to-date knowledge of the sciences of the time of what we know about the evolution of the planet. And I don't see anyone doing that. Um, I think Christian Bach has played around with it a little bit in his uh, cycle called the Xenotext, uh, but it's a little bit off-putting. Some of these uh, works can be a bit too avant-garde for their own good, and I've tried to f find a sort of measure in between being avant-garde and, and readable. Um, the more avant-garde you get, the more you risk alienating your audience, and the smaller your audience becomes. Um, <clears throat> but on the other hand, you want the poetry to be readable. So what I figured I would do here to promote this book is to just do an old-fashioned poetry reading, uh, except that it's new-fashioned insofar as it's uh, an electronic poetry reading. Um, so I will go ahead and read here from the opening section of the poem, starting with the second poem. This poem is entitled Hadean Basalt, and uh, this documents the origins of the planet. Magmas and sulfurous silicates, the moon lit with volcanic fountains of luminous wasted orange light, and its, mother, and its mother the earth a glowing ball of churning liquid rock, epidermal cooling on a cracked olivine skin, mild green upon the melting crust, and on the moon anorthite crystals congealing out of the black slag heap above the raging earth furnace below. Dunite pyroxene crystals crushed and compacted into a black basalt exoskeleton, a spiny earth riven with glowing red fissures orbited by an ivory ball of fire and shattering towers of silicate foam. In the deep liquid core of iron, a magnetosphere worn like a shield against Helios, basalt skin protecting an iron core mantled in magnets, a living giant in the wasted rubble junk heap of space, magnets mantling magmas. <clears throat> Number three, Okeanos. A pause in the bare stellar silence, and then it comes. A rain of meteorites bearing frozen ice crystals that plunge, topple, and drop out of the Gaussian night, scorching flares and scribing white lines into the black slate of an obsidian sky, hurtling, crashing into the red black orb, one, two, three, four, five, six, just like that, too many to count, and then dissolving into the blue heat of Erda's anatomy. Ice crystals melting, silvery pools of black night on the dried outer shell of its cooling lucents, pools and then lakes, seas that fuse into one vast dirt brown ocean beneath a sky the color of rust. This is what the Greeks meant when they spoke of baneful night and strife and nemesis of the gods and the elements, forms of chaos and making too ancient for human memory, but still felt in the igneous polish of basalt and granite, which have never forgotten those meteorites. Number four is called granite. Out of the roiling seas, gray-black volcanic cones leak orange-red rivers that hiss into vents of steam as the magma slides into the waters. Poseidon the earth shaker is set to work, the Egyptians knew him as Jeb, melting great slabs of basalt into the hot magma beneath re and reforging these into chunks of luminous granite that now thrust up to become Erda's first islands. The basalt sank and melted, and as the volcanoes did their work, granite islands clumped together to form the first continents. Sodium, potassium, and water, beryllium, lithium, uranium, zircon, tantalum, quartz, feldspar, mica, and amphiboly that is rich in iron. All these Vulcans smelted in the yellow fiery glow of his smithy, which cast huge shadows upon mountainous walls as he worked, hammering and thundering day and night to form this new granitic rock. Craggy mountains pushed up out of the seas as volcanoes poured cones of gray ash into the murky sunlit distance, stacked flumes in multiple columns across the haze, cataracts of water lashing about the new mountains and falling as the ground heaved and the earth buckled, blue-gray cyclopean mountains and islands, newborn, gathered in humps and ridges under the light pink rain. Poem number five <clears throat> is entitled Archean Foldings. The Black Knight, thousand fire arrows launched by hidden army, burning hunks, rocks that came searing into oceans, bringing with them tiny incunabuli, 
proteins, carbons, amino acids, <clears throat> sank into the ocean floor where they multiplied, transformed by the high pressures and the black murk of the abyssal depths into chemical polymers that writhed and spun, tiny snakes that wound and unwound, coiling and folding into strands of RNA, hatched inside eggs of hollow lipid spheres that burst asunder and multiplied through the dark seas. With translucent strands of bioplasmic chemicals, life taught itself to read and remember with nucleotide libraries, basic texts for auto-replication and reproduction of frenzied forms, long, thin, tubular strands, round, ragged, and haggard spheres, ovoid pods inside black vents that bled chemical rivers from the hot sea depths, microbeings that stripped chemicals from subterranean rocks and pumped methane into the atmosphere in huge, invisible, ascending clouds out of the seas. In the sun-soaked shallows where the arc of the sea met the curvature of the land, mud-brick towers were rising, built by a new creature, blue-green microtubules, hungry for sunlight, round towers soaking the air with oxygen stacked row upon row and painting the dirt-red sky a deep cerulean blue. Ages passed, and then a chill stiffened the earth, for oxygen eats methane and shears the earth of its gas dome. Glaciers awakened, huge advancing walls of cream-colored frozen slabs, punctured by the dim and distant oil well, oil well flares of volcanoes that ruptured the ice and filled the air with plumes of ash and cinder smoke that mixed with white haze and settled over a frigid and solemn silence. Poem number six, Proterozoic Red and Green. A dark maroon ball bleeding at the edge of the horizon into a vast white plain of ice, black volcanic cones spewing cylinders of smoke and ash at the edges of the earth, the weight of vanilla slabs upon cracked ground, the oxygenated air transforming molecules of iron that paint the rocks rust red, lime green tidal pools and blue white sea shallows, pink lakes with frosted azure depths, chalky cliffs and limestone caves, the unfolding, unflagging earth, thawing. And with that thaw, new cells erupting out of the bioplasmic pools of chemical infinitude, spindle-shaped, tubular, round, ovoid, elliptical, and mottled, cannibals, slicing into each other with chemical knives, puncturing translucent lipid membranes to feed on genetic fluids. The problem, though, the problem was viruses, with long, spidery legs and tiny geodesic thoraxes, spindly blue octagons and floating tubular capsules, pink pods with geometric cores and gap-toothed sheaths full of er erratic wayward genes. Inside the cells, lipid walls burst out of unfathomable darknesses to ensheathe long genetic polymers and protective microspheres, and then the cells with macronoiac thought clumped together with collagen and began to weave huge microbial mats into cracked pale green tiles with sulfurous yellow runnels between them, crawling over the barren earth. Bacterial cities, horizontal this time, that the viruses could no longer reach. Other cells, meanwhile, stacking like disks on the bottom of gold-flecked seas into red polyp stalks that grew with branches interwoven to form vast cellular carpets causing inland seas to bleed at the edges of their foamy serrated shores. Red algae. The Spartan rocks no longer bare, but painted red and green with microbial mats and algal rafts warring to lay waste to the sun with which to build their zoophytic organs <clears throat> that sloshed through translucent bioluminous membranes, and the rich warm air once again began to crumple and deflate like the ruinous sack of a depleted cell. Erda heaved and ruptured, continents colliding and forcing up ragged mountains like wedges out of wet mud, coppery-colored runoff and streams and vast canyons forming new min minerals, azurite and cinnabar, beryllium and cobalt, bursting out of hidden recesses in the dark earth. Rodinia collapsed, the broken earth rending in jagged gashes that opened up shining lagoons, mirroring scattered pieces of gold skies with swirling clouds bringing crumbly gray rain that weathered the rocks, drawing down the carbon dioxide. And at the poles, the slumbering glaciers were awakened once more, but this time they slid across Erda's crust all the way to the equator, where they met in a rippling white seam that sealed off the planet in a frozen cocoon of ice. Upon the stiff ball of Erda, nothing moved any longer, and the only sound that could be heard, if anyone had been there to hear it, was the rumbling of its volcanoes beneath the plains of sun-frosted ice. I think we'll stop there. Um, that's most of part one, which is entitled Magmas. Um, and that gives you a sense of, of the rhythms and the sound and the imagery uh, that should give you a sense that uh, whether or not the collection is your cup of tea, if it's something that you like. And if it is, uh, go to Amazon.com. It is available now on Amazon uh, for purchase. Uh, just type in the title Archive uh, in my name, John David Ebert, and it will come up. Or you can go to my website, uh, which is cinemadiscourse.com, where another excerpt from further on in the manuscript um, has been posted and together with a link uh, I think it's up on create space right now where it can be ordered from there it might not just yet be on Amazon but uh, it will be later today so for all intents and purposes it's, it's available on Amazon 
Um, and that's it. Thank you.